Well, as I mentioned, today is Palm Sunday, and and Palm Sunday always makes me ask a lot of questions, because it's a celebration, right? Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, and we celebrate that with like kids waving palm fronds, right? And we're saying, Hosanna, this, uh, this statement that literally means God save, save us Jesus is what we're proclaiming. And, and then by Friday, by Good Friday, it would seem that that same crowd has changed its tone to instead of save us, crucify him. And there's something so profound that we observe about humanity just in these pages of Scripture from 2,000 years ago. And I think that invites us to look into ourselves, right? How quickly we can go from praise and trust and adoration to doubt and to dismay and to turning away from Jesus in our lives. We've been walking and preparing for Easter by going through this series, Here I Am. Am. We've been looking at stories from the Bible about people who've given God their yes and who have stayed with it. And today we'll be moving into the New Testament. That's the time when Jesus is on the scene and following. And we're going to look at how God's call works in this time and how it's impacted by Jesus's presence. So I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles and turn with me to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Uh, we'll be starting at verse 17. Uh, if you want to follow along in your in a Bible, I just encourage you to slip your hand up. Ushers are coming around right now. Uh, we'd love to let you borrow a Bible for this gathering. If you don't own one, please just keep it. It's our gift to you. If you are using one of the Bibles here in the auditorium, we'll be on page 606. We're going to look at a familiar story today. The story is titled, perhaps in your Bible, as the rich young man or the rich young ruler historically. And and we're going to use him as as a typecast, as someone that Jesus invited to follow him, much like others in the New Testament and like ourselves. And and we're going to look at the cost of saying, here I am, as Jesus said it to this young man and how he ultimately invites us to the same thing. So if you're turned there, ready to go, Mark chapter 10, let's jump in at verse 17. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down, and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? All right, let's pause here real quick and and just acknowledge this is a great question. And he came running, looking for that answer. And if we just step into this story as people who want our lives to count for something, who understand that there is a God and that we're ultimately accountable to him, we might be asking the question, how do I get to the place where where God really has a hold of me? Where everything that I have is leaning into who he is and what he has for me, how do I get to that place? Whether you've said yes to God or not, a central human question for all of us at some point is how do I make my life count for what matters most? Now, you'll also notice about this question that it is very transactional. And the young man asks, what must I do to essentially get what I want? He's not asking about a relationship with Jesus or a relationship with God. He's looking really to take care of himself. Jesus, we find, picks up on the root of his question, and he meets him where he is, but he also invites him to dive deeper. Let's continue reading at verse 18. Why do you call me good, Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. Jesus essentially says, look, you know the answer. Why are you even asking me? Remember some context here, right? We're in Israel in this story, and Jesus recognizes the man both socially and ethnically is Jewish. As such, Jesus knew that this young man grew up memorizing scripture. He probably recited it daily. He had the Ten Commandments memorized more than likely, and he knew the Pharisaical law like the back of his hand. You had to be to be successful in this culture. And as we know from the title and from later on in the story, this young man was very successful. And so Jesus says, hey, you already know the answer. You know what God requires. Keep the law, keep the commandments, do what God says. I don't want to skip over the significance of Jesus's answer. 
This is no small task, right? He basically summarizes six of the Ten Commandments, which are the most basic set of instructions, but also perhaps the hardest to achieve. And he's saying the cost of eternal life, the cost of following me, if you want my answer, the cost of following Jesus is everything. He says it's everything, all the rules, all the commandments, everything that's on the list, that's the cost of following me. Jesus is in no way trying to make this an easy yes. As a matter of fact, I think he's starting kind of at the deep end of the pool. You want to know the cost of following God, of saying yes to God? It's everything. It's your whole life. Don't murder, steal, cheat, lie, right? Be a good person in all areas. And this might be similar to us, like taking a street pole. And we might ask, hey, what makes a person good? We might find ourselves getting different answers today than perhaps Jesus did, because we're not living in ancient Israel, but we would get an American answer, and we could probably find some similarities. We might hear things like, be kind to people, right? Treat others the way you want to be treated. Don't hurt other people. These are some of the same answers that you might give to answer that question. Hey, what makes a good person? which is to say that that we know that in order to be a good person, it takes everything, all areas, nothing left out. Like we know we can't just be good on Sunday, but not on Monday, right? We know you, you can't be a good boss while also taking advantage of people. You can't be a good student who cheats sometimes. You can't be a good spouse who only loves some days. Similarly, we can't say, yes, that we follow God, but not follow him in every aspect of our lives. We, like this young man, hope that, that, that we get something from this connection between our actions and our goodness, that there's a reward in eternity for us being this good of a person. And the surprising reality that Jesus introduces is that in his kingdom, the invitations aren't based on our actions. It's not based on our goodness. It's based solely on the finished work of Christ on the cross. This is what Pastor Stephanie mentioned last week, that none of our good works measure up to God's holy standard. But the young man didn't know that yet. Jesus is still trying to get people to understand the truth about this kingdom that he is bringing. So when the question is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I think Jesus settles for giving him just an impossible list of to-dos. You want to get into God's kingdom on your terms, on your strength, on your transaction? Let's just be perfect. Why don't we start there? It, It feels to me a little bit like Jesus is even dismissive to this question. He's giving a safe, well-known, easy-to-accept answer for his culture. You want to know the way to get into heaven? Keep all of the rules. Be perfect. It takes everything. Which, to us today, might seem kind of intimidating, right? You might be thinking, I'm thinking right now, I don't know that I measure up to that standard of everything. Do I need to leave, or is there some hope coming? Let's just hold on. This young person knew the list. He knew the law. He knew he'd done his best to live according to God's standard. But I think he wanted to make sure. He didn't just want some generic answer. He wanted to know what it really meant to honor God, to give God his best. He already said his yes to God before the question like Samuel, and he wants to know the specific cost of following Jesus, not just the generic answer. Let's pick back up the story in verse 20. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Now, I don't know if the young man believed this or not. I don't think he's lying to Jesus. That seems out of character, right? Like he probably thought he was this good. He must have just missed Jesus' Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, hey, if you're angry enough to kill somebody, it's the same as actually doing it. Or if you lust in your heart, it's just as poisonous as actual adultery. But the young man, for whatever reason, is pretty confident. And I think that Jesus meets him here. Maybe he rolls up his sleeves, gives him his full attention. I picture that Jesus is walking towards Jerusalem as the, as the text describes, and this young man runs up to him, throws himself down at his feet, asks his question, but maybe Jesus doesn't even break stride, right? He answers in step. Just keep the commandments. You know the rules. You know what's expected until this point. I like to picture maybe Jesus stops, looks the young man in the eyes, turns around from whatever direction he's facing. 
Because he sees that this young person is hopeful for a deeper answer. That he doesn't just want the generic on the surface answer. He wants the invitation in to full life. Let's pick it up. Verse 21. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There's still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come, follow me. At this the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Notice the text points out that it isn't the follow me part that trips up this person. It identifies it's because of his many possessions. And the conversation shifts from gaining eternal life to instead having treasures in heaven by losing treasures on earth. Jesus recognizes that this young man has said yes, but if he wants the answer that's beyond the surface, that's deeper than the Sunday school answer of God wants our everything, he recognizes it has to get personal for this young man and for us. And this is what's ultimately, for me, so beautiful and compelling and difficult about this text, because it's so easy sometimes to give an unexamined yes to God, right? Like, like level with me. We know we should say yes to God in everything, right? And if we read the Bible and show up to church, we kind of know that we, we have to, right? Like, we can't say no to God. That doesn't end well for anybody. We understand that to follow God means to put him first in everything, right? The idea that following Jesus costs you everything probably isn't new. It's probably not profound. It may not even be challenging to you. I'm sure that many of you, just like the young man in this story, have already given God your yes in everything. And if you haven't, I'd wager that the reason is that you know that saying yes to God is going to cost you more more than you've been willing to pay up until this point, more than you're willing to give up until this point, and and perhaps that's why you haven't said yes. The problem is that on on the other side of this conversation, everything is a really hard concept to nail down. And we're so finite and limited and in the moment that we can't even conceive of all that God might ask us to give up as we follow him in the future. Right? Giving up things that we can't even imagine. Uh, my point is this. It's hard to say yes to giving God everything when we don't know the full cost. It's hard to say yes to giving God everything when we don't know, we don't fully understand what it could cost us. And Jesus doesn't want to dupe us, so Jesus mercifully gets very specific. He doesn't leave the young man or us wondering just what it, with the answer of a generic everything. He looks with grace and compassion and love and he peers into our hearts. He presses into those areas that will be most costly for us. Those areas where our yes to him will cost us the most. Where, where if we don't say yes, it will trip us up. And in love, he points out those things and invites us to something deeper than just everything. He says, what about that thing? Some wise sages throughout history call this the thing behind the thing. What's what's deeper? What's behind the easy answer? What's more specific, perhaps, to give up? And he points and he says, what about that thing? What about the thing that's stopping me from being Lord in your life? What about the thing that might pull you off course? Jesus says, in his love, I want to remove that barrier. For the rich young man in this story, it was his possessions. That's where his trust, his hope, his security was founded. And there are endless sermons and teachings that we can explore on that one issue. But I'd like us not to get caught up in his area today. Instead, I'd like to ask what it might be for you. What have you found in your pursuit of Jesus is the hardest thing for you to let go of. Your most prized possession, as it were. Something that your identity might be wrapped up in. What's your thing behind everything? It might be a job for you, a title. It might be a hobby, something that just takes away your attention. It could even be good things like family and kids, but they distract you from what God might be calling you to. 
It might be wrapped up in your identity, in your sexuality. It might be wrapped up in your freedom and your rights. One thing was clear from Pastor Phil's messages. It was a Porsche for him, right? Not because he had one, but that was the thing that he was dreaming on, that for him to follow God, he felt like God asked him to give up on all of those places. He's mentioned it a few times now. But I wonder how about for you? What do you cling to? And where do you resist letting go? Because ultimately, at the end of the day, that's what your everything will cost you. Let's review some of our stories, even from this series. For Abraham, it was Isaac, right? Remember that promised child, God's own gift to him. For Jacob, it was Joseph. For Moses, it meant going back to Egypt, facing his dark past. For Samuel, it was confronting Eli and the systematic structures that God called him to come up against. We've seen this time and time again in our stories this series, but what is it for you? What does everything actually cost you tangibly? Not just in principle or just in your thoughts, but in your actual life. Now, it's critical to pull back for a second here and ask why, right? Why is God after our everything? Because at this point, you might be thinking that Jesus seems a little mean, right? Like, why would he go after those areas that are most important to our hearts and lives that we value most? Perhaps God seems a little vindictive. Maybe he's a bit masochistic. Does, Does he get some kind of satisfaction or something from making us miserable? I want to remind us where this conversation started. Remember what drove Jesus to ask this question in the first part of verse 21? It says, looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. Genuine love for this rich young man who was asking, hey, how do I do something that matters with my life? How do I wind up in God's good graces in eternity? And Jesus says, hey, that's easy. Just give up everything, right? Put God first in your life. Say yes to what God is asking you. Say, here I am, Lord. Your servant is listening before you even hear the question. And Perhaps like us, the rich young man in the story says, yes, Lord, speak, your servant is listening. I've kept all of these laws since I was a child, right? Just sometimes like us, I'd imagine we've heard in the series, we've said our yes to God. Here I am, Lord, I'll give you everything. And Jesus has genuine love for the man and for us. He says, okay, then I want to make sure you fully understand, that you fully count the cost. I don't want you to think that a generic yes is all that this takes. You can just raise your hand and pray a prayer one time and that that's the whole cost of following me. It starts there for sure, but it takes a daily dying to self so that Christ can be Lord in your inmost being set aside for him alone. So while it may feel like Jesus is going for the jugular here, he is. But the reason is not to harm us, but to save us. Much like a surgeon removes a limb to save the whole life, or or we cut off a tree branch in order to save the tree, Jesus mercifully does open heart surgery to remove those last remnants of our sinful nature that have the potential to become cancerous to our souls. It's not because he's a control freak or an egomaniac, or even because he's God and he can do whatever he wants to do. It is Jesus' love that asks us not just for our everything, but for the very last thing. This isn't easy, by the way. Jesus knows that. He understands how difficult it is for the ruler, but for us as well. He actually has a side conversation with his disciples here that shows us this. Let's resume in verse 23. Jesus looked around. He said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. This amazed them, but Jesus said again, dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astonished. Then who in the world can be saved, they asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, It is impossible, but not with God. Everything is possible with God. 
Do you get a sense of the hope from Jesus as he says those last lines? His wry smile, there's a twinkle in his eyes. He's like the magician who knows the end of the trick or a storyteller who knows that even though the hero looks defeated, the story isn't over. And the disciples say, Jesus, none of this makes sense. Jesus says, I know. I know that it's hard, that it's expensive, that it's costly, and that what I'm asking for doesn't feel fair or good, but I also know the end of the story. I know the answer to the question that your soul is asking, and I'm telling you, this is the path to take. This is the path that leads you away from what you want to what you actually need. Let's keep reading verse 28. Then Peter began to speak up. We've given up everything to follow you, he said. Interesting choice of word there, everything, Peter. Verse 29, yes, Jesus replied. And I assure you that everyone who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, mothers, children, and property, along with the persecution. And in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. But many who are the greatest now will be the least important then. And those who seem least important now will be the greatest then. Peter draws our attention, perhaps saying the very things that we're thinking, Jesus, we've given you everything. Jesus says, I know. And in his mercy, in his love, gets very specific. Again, I picture that he's gathering with his disciples and he's looking at them one by one, knowing the cost that they paid to follow him. And so it's not just a list that he goes through. It's like the rich ruler where he's intimately familiar with us and he points out and acknowledges the things that cost us. I know it's cost you brothers. I know it's cost your sisters. I know your mother, your father, your children, your property, the family business. I see that you've given up not just everything, but the very last most important things. And I'm here to tell you that there is a path that leads to true greatness in eternity along that way. This is the grand reversal. That when we give up everything, not just generally, but actually in pursuit of God and his kingdom, Jesus promises that eternity is multitudes better than anything that we've given, lost, or sacrificed. C.S. Lewis is a, a famous Christian author, and he muses about Christ's invitation to eternity and our ultimate lack of understanding. Here's how he would say it. He says, we are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased. We think the things that we're sacrificing are a lot. And they are. We're giving everything. This is our whole life we're talking about, our most prized possessions, what we live for, what defines us. And Jesus's invitation into his eternal presence in his love and his kindness is to ask for those very specific things. Given freely and enjoy, right? Not just as a trade. This isn't give to get more, but to give all that we have because we understand that Jesus is who he says he is. And when we do that, we discover that Jesus absolutely is that. He's everything that he said he is and even more. And that he's worth giving absolutely everything for, even the last thing. But he doesn't mince terms, right? What is the cost of following Jesus? It is everything. And everything includes the very last thing, but we can't separate that from the purpose because while the cost of following, of saying yes to God is high, so is the product. Because what your yes to God produces in your soul, in your life, in the world, and in God's kingdom is so much bigger and better than anything your everything could produce apart from him. So I wonder where you're at individually saying yes to God today. Perhaps over the course of this series, you've been building up some resistance to an area that maybe God's been pointing at. It's felt mean or harsh or you didn't understand why, but now you know that it might be the last thing that God is putting his finger on to say, that's the last thing that I'm asking for from you. 
And today you recognize that it's his mercy that he's asking for it. That while it costs everything, it is worth it. I want to challenge you and to give you space today to write down your one thing. What's that last thing that you might be holding on to? That thing that might be deeper to you than everything, right? You can grab a card from the seat back in front of you, write it down, maybe send a text message to yourself so you can see it later. Whatever it is, take this moment to do some business with God so that you have time to wrestle with what you've heard today. Or maybe today you've never given God your first yes. You're not to the last thing yet because you're still stuck at the everything. But God's love and compassion is reaching out to you, inviting you, calling you by name, and you've been hiding in the bushes. But today you're ready to say, here I am. I want to follow you, Jesus, even though the cost is high. All I can tell you, all I can promise you is this. God loves you more than you could ever fathom or understand. And he asks for everything, not because he needs it, but because you do. And in giving everything, actually everything, even the very last thing to Jesus, only in that place of surrender does God meet you. And does he invite you into his provision and you discover that everything you had was nothing compared to the everything that God has for you.